We've got the horse player now handicapping trio with you for a night school on this program from the far end, Brian W. Spencer, the man in the middle, our postman, Brian Natto, and I'm Jeremy Plunk. We're talking about the big races, because you know what? Things are better when they're bigger. We like the stakes races. There's something about them that's attractive as a horse player and as a fan. Brian, when you do a, a, a stakes race, when you look at it, do you look at it the same way as an everyday race, or does it change up your attitude a little? Well, I, it's, it's, it can almost be as much mental as anything, because the stakes races, you pretty much, you know every horse in there. You have a great understanding of them. I always say, you know, a race like the Kentucky Derby, I don't need to handicap the race. You like who you like. And sometimes that's a fine line, and it, it can get you in a little bit of a trouble. But uh, I don't think you look at stakes races any differently, at least on paper, like from a pace perspective or how it's going to be run. I think you, I think stakes races still go through basic handicapping. I just think the challenge sometimes is a mental aspect of of you. you a lot of times you have favorite horses in stakes races. Well, they might not necessarily have the best winning chance, though. Spence, how about you when it comes to the stakes races? Some of that same thought? Uh, pretty much exactly the same. It's, uh, I mean, when you're handicapping the race, you're still going through your, your pace, your potential trips. You're still doing all the same things you should be doing with a conditioned $5,000 claimer. But especially for me, because I have uh, on more than one occasion been accused of being an emotional better, uh, <laughs> betting with my heart a little more than I should, it, it, it can be very tough to sort of say, I love this horse personally. Yeah. Let's not let that influence whether or not I think he or she can win here today. Um, but the, the one advantage that you do have in stakes races, which for me oftentimes sort of gets me as a better, because I, I like to try to find that potential for chaos, is that stakes horses by and large are going to be more consistent than your cheaper claiming horses. So in that way, it always feels to me like it's tougher to find a price because it's tougher to find the horse who's gonna jump up with the wild race that you don't expect. I think we all fall victim of having some preconceived notions about stakes horses that we don't have with everyday horses. Because to be frank, a lot of times you open the racing form for a claiming race on an afternoon and the horses are fairly new to you. You might have yeah. seen a few of them or, or you have some semblance of who they are, but they didn't stick in your mind. But when you open the program for a stakes race, all eight horses in the race sometimes are horses that you're familiar with. I know for me a preconceived notion could be a tough beat from a previous race. I saw a horse I liked him the last time and it was a tough beat. And I'll be damned if I'm not going to get beat by him again. I'm going to play him back the next time. That can be a wrong strategy. I mean, you've got to kind of separate that. Some preconceived notions you guys might find. Well, I think that's a great point, and I think you have to that that you kind of have to be honest with yourself. But you know, if 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 a horse gets nailed on the line, and you thought he should have won, but they went 46 and change that day, and he's a closer. And then today you look at the pace and you say, you know what, there's a loose leader in the race. Well, maybe that doesn't matter that your horse got beaten by a nose last time because it's a totally different scenario today. And I think you, I think everything's relevant to today. It, what they did last time, sure, it's, a, it's got a big deal, but you, you have to look at it in terms of today's race. And each race is different and the pace is different and things like that. And it doesn't necessarily equate to what's gonna happen today just because it might have happened last time. And I think that they're, uh, and I'll, I'll sort of throw in the other side of that coin, is that I think it is it is a good thing to be forgiving at times. It is a good thing to say, you know, oh, I, I don't think that was a total clunker. My horse ran his or her race, but just, just didn't run the race I exactly expected of them that day. It is okay to say, it doesn't make much sense to me, so I'm gonna wheel right back. At the same time, you need to make sure that the horse still fits in today's race. You, you can't just blindly follow the horse for the sake of following a horse and trying to vindicate yourself, but I also would advise to not, not be completely unforgiving because a lot of times some, some of the best hits I've had are the second time off of a trip note when a horse runs a big race or some sort of troubled race and then they don't run the way I expect them to the next time and I say, oh, I really feel like that horse is capable of better. I forgive that horse for that one and then they come out and they do run a better race the second time back. I think you made a really good point there that I wasn't planning on talking about, but I think it dovetails on what you were saying is, with stakes horses, a lot of times you can excuse the past effort. Because let's be frank, they're in a race with four, five, six other seven good horses. Stakes horses don't rattle off five, six in a row. They don't run through their conditions like a horse may on an everyday race. So being forgiving of a stakes horse, running fifth in a grade two isn't the worst thing you could possibly do. And if you can find any reason whatsoever why it might have happened, you know, different course conditions, wide post position, anything at all, a different jockey today, mm -hmm. maybe being forgiving in a stakes race is a little easier than a never 
everyday play. Yeah, again, I think there's a, a fine line. Let's take a race like the, the Kentucky Derby, and, and you have horses in the, the Kentucky Derby that were beaten 30 and 40 lengths. Right. That maybe is sometimes tougher to be forgiving than a horse that was six feet in ten lengths. And I think sometimes you, you, you have to walk that line. The good thing about that is, though, normally you're going to get a much better price. And there's nothing wrong with tagging along at 10, 12 to 1 if you're going to get rewarded. If your horse is going to be a giant underlay again, 3, 4 to 1, then I don't really want anything to do with them. But if the price is right, we can always be forgiving. We can always find something there to string along with again. Yeah, I, I should add that disclaimer. I'm never forgiving at even money. I'm only <laughs> forgiving if I'm getting that 9 to 2, 10 to 1, especially if it's a better price than the race that I'm forgiving the last time out. I'm not even going to forgive you if you bet an even money shot. You're on your own on that one. We stay clear of those kind around here, hopefully. It's okay every once in a while we'll get on one, but that's a different story. That's a, that's a, that's every, a mid-price contender for him. Every, <laughs> every team's got to have a little bit of chalk in it, and uh, you know we, we know where ours is. <laughs> now, guys, when it comes to stakes races, what are your favorites to look at? Obviously, the Triple Crown races get you mm -hmm. excited. They're jackpot pools. So from a gambling standpoint, the Triple Crown races are fantastic. Breeders' Cup Day yeah. the same way. But are, is there a pigeonhole of stakes races you like more than others? Well, me personally, I, I, I like the older handicap division because I, I just think those are the most genuine horses. They're the horses that are not apt to come in and out of a form cycle. I mean. Early on in my handicapping days, someone told me, you know, stay away from the Phillies because sometimes they're up, they're down, they don't want to run today, they're, they have issues. And, and I think if you're betting on the older males, at least you can bank on some consistency yeah. in performance that you don't necessarily get, especially from two-year-olds, three-year-old Phillies, things like that. It's just it's tough to, to bank on a consistent performance day in and day out like you tend to get with older stakes horses. And for me, uh to be honest about stakes races, obviously I like them. They're, they're, they're some of the most exciting races that we get to see. At the same time, I almost feel like I'm better in mundane Wednesday afternoon races because as you talked about at the top, everybody knows those stakes horses. Right. So the fact that I'm following a meet doesn't give me a competitive advantage. A $5,000 claimer on a Wednesday afternoon, I know all 10 of those horses if I'm following that meet. So I feel like I do have an advantage over that casual player. But for me, I think that, uh, the Kentucky Derby is an arch enemy of mine based on uh, my wagering history. I really, I mean, I, lo I don't think anything from a wagering perspective tops the Breeders' Cup. You get, it's the only day of the year where multiple grade one winners get sent to post at 30 to one and nobody bats an eye. And you just have so many quality races back to back to back that yes, it does make those multi-race wagers, the pick threes and pick fours more difficult. But as that kind of player, that's the kind of day I just am, you know, licking my chops at because I'm going to get a pick four with four quality races with full fields, grade one winners at huge prices. And I think that that is just, for me, the ultimate day of wagering on stakes races and also the most exciting for me to follow uh, over those, those two days of Breeders' Cup races. You mentioned pick threes, pick fours, and even on a regular Saturday, if you've got one stakes race at your track, it may not be a competitive affair. There just might be a horse who lays over all the state-bred milers on the turf and it just doesn't matter. A, a star guitar, you know, it, it, back in the day in Louisiana, didn't matter who he was lining up against, he was beating them in, in the right race. You've got to play those multi-race wagers to get to those horses a lot of times to make the stakes races appealing. So a good stakes race bet could be to look at the races around them. Well, no doubt, especially let's say like you, you mentioned a star guitar. Well, th there's, a, there's your single, and now you can go spreading in the other legs around them. And I always, you know, say you're looking for chaos. You're looking for that one race where you don't know who's going to win, but you just, you're just you pretty sure it's going to be chaos. It's going to be a 20 to 1, yeah. and then maybe you buy the race. Maybe you use 7 of the 10 because you've got, you've got the single at the end, the anchor, that allows you to do that. It allows you to scale down your ticket, and you don't have to spend so much because you have that single. And there's nothing wrong with singling. There's nothing wrong with playing the favorite at 3 to 5 if you know the favorite's going to win because then you work around it right. and you can get more opportunity. Shameful to bet him in the wind pool. There you go. But, but singling him so. in a pick four I think is smart money. Big Brown won the Preakness in 2008, 20 cents on the dollar in a big field. And the pick four still paid $500 for a buck ending to him. You know, if you were trying to beat Big Brown that day, you were crazy. But if you used him to bookend the pick four, it became a pick three. And I think that's how you can kind of capitalize on a big favorite in the stakes. And the other thing, too, is that when, when you look at those pick fours, let's just use that as the example, um, 
obviously I love going searching and fishing for chaos too when you just get that feel about that race but uh over the years, especially working with uh, with you, JP, because this is one of your favorite things, there's nothing wrong with saying this three to five is gonna win, but you know what? I don't see anything better than a seven to two winning the other three races, so let's go two by one by one by two and punch that $2 ticket 15 times. You spend your $30 and you're not going to get a $600 return if you're right, but it's okay if for every $2 that pick four pays 25, you've right. got it 15 times, you just banked 400 bucks. I right. always like to say, don't look for something that's not there. That's a good point. You know, favorites, they win 35% of the time, give or take. They're gonna win. You, you have to accept it. You can't beat every one to five shot. They're one to five for a reason. So make them your friend as opposed to throwing money away trying to beat them. Let's give a couple handicapping tips now. We've talked about a lot about how to approach the stakes races. When you get down to the brass tacks, you got the best trainers, you got the best jockeys, you got the best horses on the grounds. Things that are going to start separating these horses. For me, I think you can probably watch three videos for any stakes race and figure the field out. Three past trip videos. So to me, go back and look at these common opponent races against each other last time, or horses ran against other good horses that you know looking at their name on paper. This was a good horse. Watch three videos of the stakes races. That's my advice. Find the three most important trips, go back and review those, and see if you might be able to flop the order somewhere. Yeah, I always like to ask myself if we're looking, you know, maybe from outside the box is, is what, are the, what is the horse looking to accomplish today? We know there's grade ones, grade twos, and grade threes. So if a grade one horse is entered in a grade three off a long layoff, there's a good chance that he doesn't want to win today or he doesn't have to win today. So I think you need to know you need to know the goals of some of those horses and where they might be aiming at in the future and if today's that goal or three weeks down the road is the main goal and then you can kind of act accordingly to say well maybe they're not totally cranked today. And also uh, do it do a little bit of research, dig through some results charts, which would go along with what JP was saying about watching those videos, because not every horse dropping from a grade one to a grade three is taking the same drop. Not all grade ones, twos, and threes are created equally. A lot of times we'll see a grade two and we'll be talking and we'll say, oh my God, that shouldn't be a grade two, or you'll see a grade one that looks like it's, or a grade three that should be a grade one, and that's more difficult. So pay attention to not only the classes as they're listed on paper, but go back and see who else was in that race. Maybe a really great horse was in there and ran a bad six that day. At least that bolsters the class rating of that particular race. So don't always take those at face value. Do a little bit of homework and try to find the stronger and weaker races for the level and leverage those to your advantage. Stakes races are what it's all about. It's what draws fans into the game. I remember being a kid and couldn't wait for the Friday evening newspaper to get there with the Saturday entries because I wanted to see who were in the stakes races. That's what it's all about. We love to play the races during the week, but we can't wait for Saturday.